Kia ora koutou, e te whānau o te rauheringa o Aotearoa, o te rōwhu whakahau hoki, tēnā koutou. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you Tahu Pōtiki. If you have a look in your conference handbook, you can read the official bio at your own leisure. Uh, what the bio doesn't tell you <laughs> um, is what I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously though. Um, I first met Tahu Pōtiki last century um, when he was a social work student here at the University of Otago. What I can tell you about Tahu is that he is a man passionate in service to his whānau, his hapū and his iwi, and he is passionate about his reo, the reo kaitahu. And I can also tell you he'll be champing at the bit there because I'm taking up his speaking time. So without any further ado, I'll introduce you to Tahu Pōtiki. Ao kia ora anō tātou. Koutou nga kaori anō kia kitea. Tēnā koutou. Koutou koa pōheritia kētia I te, I te rātapura, uh, mihi anō tēnei kia, kia tātou. Tātou kā tōku hui nei, ai runga i te kaupapo tēnei wā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kā toa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a little bit intimidating. I don't think I'd ever be saying I feel a bit intimidated by a mob of librarians, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an area that I have spent a lot of time thinking about, and I guess if you're really not in the business, that's not a surprise. But... The whole broader question of information management and the relationship between your very important institutions and uh, iwi is something which has uh, had relevance to me over the last uh, 25 years. And today I'm just going to talk, a little, it's a little bit different than what I put in my um, abstract, I think. Uh, originally I didn't quite realise we were going to be talking about the same thing in the panel discussion and then so I just thought, gee, I better apply my thinking to this in a bit of a different way, which is, which is what I've done. <clears throat> the, the years of the Ngaitahu claim to the Waitrangi Tribunal were transformative for Ngaitahu. Uh, a new sense of, of confidence and identity emerged as a result of the, the scholarly work required to argue successfully before the Tribunal and it also required a new form of internal analysis of our cultural resources and capacity. A stock take, if you like, that had not really been undertaken previously. New information was uncovered, and the tribal narratives, histories and traditions were floated up into the public eye in an unprecedented fashion. Rich manuscripts held in archives and family collections were translated and reinterpreted, and we found out we knew much more about ourselves than we had previously realised. Ironically, the fact that we were setting about learning more about ourselves opened up the door for those who knew just the shade more than this generation of learners to claim some cultural leadership territory, and often not for the right reasons. At one level, it forced those, forced those with, the, with the slightest strength in te reo Māori to take on senior oratorical responsibilities. But with such lofty expectations all came, also came the inevitable requests to bless, th to bless things, to open things, to lift sacred tapu off things, etc., etc. Much of this space was eagerly filled by cultural tricksters, who decided these gaps should be plugged with invented cultural knowledge and ritual. Generally our own, these shamans have created Carlo Castaneda-like followings, convincing others that they were taught well-hidden tribal secrets passed only to a chosen few. This has included invented language, history and place names that are now making their way into credible scholarly works, onto cadastral maps, and into and onto libraries. <clears throat> 
It also created space for Pākehā scholars to expand their research work into highly questionable and speculative areas of study that resulted in significant and prolific publications that have sought to completely rewrite legitimate tribal histories. These publications also find themselves into the libraries and other knowledge systems, and the way they are treated and classified tend to give them credibility. During the 1970s, a watershed work was published, which many of you will be familiar with, called The Great New Zealand Myth. For the previous 100 years, conventional knowledge regarding the Māori settlement and occupation of New Zealand had been defined by two major characters, Alston Best, Stevens and Percy Smith, the drivers behind the Journal of the Polynesian Society, which promoted certain theories of Polynesian migration. Two particular pieces of work significantly in influenced the nature of Māori tradition and how it was interpreted. Hawaiki sought to explain the origins of the Māori race and their belief systems, and it did so in a way that interpreted Māori mythology via a highly analytical Western framework that sought the facts. It is nearly impossible to equate traditional narrative with factual truth. Tradition in its very nature is rooted in mythology, no different to other semi-religious stories that span the periods of God and ancestor. Percy Smith focused on proving certain mythological terms and concepts equated to an historical explanation of Māori origins. Irihia was a sacred Māori homeland also known as Israel. Adi was rice, a traditional food, and Il was Jehovah, one God above the others. This was sourced back to ancient knowledge gathered in northern India and connections to Aryan people and a Jehovah-based religion. This extraordinary leap was not questioned that a number of traditions, karakia, waiata, were constructed by Māori themselves as they followed these religious ideas. The other work, the law of the Whariwānanga, picked up on the eel theme as well as a generalisation of Māori migration myths. The book claimed an elite school of higher learning that was privy to special higher knowledge about one supreme being. It further claimed that two very important tuhunga were supplying informants with select information, and that one of those informants happened to be Pākehā. It created notions of a great fleet and the arrival of Māori here in Aotearoa. These theories, which also suited the colonial attitudes of the late 19th century New Zealand, were totally undone by David Simmons. He basically showed that the primary source material underpinning their theories were inaccurately referenced and he even implied the conclusions were contrived to suit the theories of the time. Sir Peter Buck had earlier challenged some of the thinking, but it largely went unnoticed and certainly never led to the rejection of the JPS theories. Simmons, though, achieved a total rethink of Māori tradition. It's therefore somewhat ironic that Simmons himself ended up at the cutting edge of cultural reinvention himself. In 1994, in his book for Kairo, and then in further other official publications, Simmons claimed to have identified certain characteristics of Ngaitahu carving that had no reference back to Ngaitahu sources of knowledge or other credible reference material whatsoever. In fact, he claimed that when a waka prau was found at Mason's Bay on Stewart Island, he knew who the waka belonged to and who had done the carving simply by observing the carving details from a photograph. These spurious claims infuriated the Ngaitahu leadership, particularly the more scholarly amongst them. Such creation of knowledge is seen by many iwi as entirely detrimental to their own cultural evolution and tenoranga teratanga. There are plenty of people that get upset because Pākehā study and publish articles on Māori matters including language, traditions and history. But good scholarship is still good scholarship and it's difficult to challenge. And within Ngaitahu we are beholding to several thorough Pākehā scholars who deepened the Ngaitahu knowledge storehouse. But Ngaitahu was so concerned by the content of Simmons' book that it was the intent of Ngaitahu to take legal action. And this is actually when we discovered that as a tribe, 
we did not exist. We had no rights to sue or be sued. Tribes were not considered a body corporate under the law, and although there was already a settlement of some several hundred million dollars in the wings, we then discovered that the Crown had no one to legally settle with or vest the assets in. This particular moment was a significant catalyst in developing the Tribal Council to Runanga Ongaitahu. Interestingly, Simmons continued his descent into the bizarre world of cultural fantasy, becoming a major supporter of the Kohuiaro movement that claimed to be affiliated to a decades-old international, indigenous and royal family network tied back to Genghis Khan and dynasties in China that could identify the absolute supreme chief of all the New Zealand Māori tribes. Some of you will remember the circus that emerged around Kohuiaro as Simmons promoted his personal informant for most of his later works, Teridia, or James Ngātua, as the Ariki of Aotearoa. For many Māori, the major biocultural progressions of the past 30 years have only served to deliver positive benefits, but they have sometimes also created unexpected conflicts. The Waitangi Tribunal system ultimately leads to a clash of views about rights and wrongs, and includes in-depth exploration of differing views of pre-European tradition and history. One major conflict that emerged during the Ngaitahu claim was a lot of tradition from one family about the Waitaha tribe and associated traditions. Although the traditions sometimes conflicted with the standard Ngaitahu ideas, most understood why they had developed in parallel during the late 19th century. This particular whānau, or this collective of whānau, had become involved in their own hybrid Māori Christian religious movement, which, when such movements have occurred across Māori history, has continu continually proven to provide a reformative view of Māori tradition. There was a... Uh, a view that um, a lot of the illnesses which were uh, befalling Māori during the 1860s and the 1870s was a result of breach of tapu, sacred areas that uh, had not been adequately cleared, that had been forgotten as the people had moved away from ancient Māori beliefs. And so there was a religion called Kaingārara that had been set up on the uh, west coast of the North Island under a chap called Tamitito. And his... The, his entire purpose was to go around and, using the new Christian God, clear the sacred tapu areas. He came down here to the South Island, and uh, the stories are great. That We've got old diaries recording um, you know, fights with supernatural beings on the beach and all sorts of great tales. And on his way back north, after having spent some time in jail for uh, he, he, some poor little boy got sick, so he cut him and rubbed gunpowder into his wounds and shoved him in a cold bath, whereupon he promptly passed away. And so he got locked up, and, but they, they couldn't find any um, uh, malice in, in all that he was the cause of the death, so he, they released him. And on his way back, he stopped at a little place called Aro Whenua, which is just outside of Tamuka, and there he identified a young man by the name of Te Mai Haroa, placed his hand on him and said, you carry on my work, and he headed off north. And Te Mai Haroa, uh, developed quite a following, uh, very similar to the other uh, Māori prophets during the 19th century, and they eventually moved right up into the, uh, the area inland from Timaru, uh, what's now known as Omearama or Te Aumarama, uh, right up towards Twizel, and uh, they stayed there for a couple of years, eventually forced off by all people. The Omaru armed constabulary came up and said, look, time to sling your hook, mate, time to go. But he also had set up a whariwānanga, and in the wānanga he was teaching a very peaceful doctrine based on some valid traditions around Waitaha, the very first people that came to the South Island and then covered the earth like ants. Um, it's quite a, uh, the, the, the narratives that we do hold, and there are several from the whariwānanga, are very poetic, uh, they're very uh, metaphorical, there's a lot of talk about the star charts and the travels from Hawaii and it's stuff that's recognisable as valid Māori tradition. But it's been blown up in many minds into this sort of idyllic, uh, peaceful people that knew no war and, of course, um, 
it's run amok a little. I'll, I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, in its own right, such reformation has its validity, and it's hard to argue the place of te koti, te fiti, tohu kākahi, te waru, rātna, uh, in terms of, of um, shaping Māori thought through into the present time. Those influences are absolutely a part of our evolution. Similarly to my Harua, the Waitaha prophet created a legitimate road bump in South Island Māori history that introduced expanded interpretations of traditional Māori ideas. This has a valid position in our historical narrative. But such road bumps have also provided opportunities for cultural swindlers both within and without of the tribe. Some excellent work has been done by people like Bill Dacre, Buddy McCarty, and even Michael King was interested in developing a biography of Te Mai Haru at one time. But others have taken a, a kernel of Waitaha truth and grown a giant, twisted, convoluted beanstalk for their own demented purposes. <laughs> I suspect Barry Browsford has been sufficiently critiqued and defrauded for most to realise his Waitaha and New Life publications are not to be trusted. His early works, The Tattooed Land and Greenstone Trails, were well received by Ngaitahu. But then he went completely off the rails and claimed to have been given singular access to the elders who had never before imparted this, such sacred knowledge. Those closest to these elders continued to dispute that such knowledge existed, let alone that their own whānau decided to impart stories of such import to a few Pākehā they barely knew. And when the book was eventually published, there was like nine elders, I think, uh, and their photos published in the introduction, and all of them had passed away by the time the book had been published. Brailsford actually suggested the stars and the spirits determined this significant moment, but his fantastical ramblings ultimately undid any credibility that he had earned in previous years. Any first-year scholar would make short work of Brailsford's claims. They clearly have no basis in actual southern traditions. And perhaps that's the most disturbing thing about his publications. There's an arrogance as he chooses to ignore the richness that does exist with Waitaha tradition, and with a little more finesse, if he had drawn on the actual written records preserved, he may have strengthened his credibility. But he failed to do that, and the stories he publishes may, well as, may as well be James Cameron's avatar, trying to be disguised as a NASA report on space exploration. <laughs> In a modern setting, even the most seasoned expert in Māori tradition draws on more established methodologies of validating information rather than simply accepting the words of any grey-haired individual that can speak Māori. Although when all roads ultimately lead back to oral primary sources, there has been a local evolution of validating tradition, unbelievably originally led by David Simmons himself. Simmons proposed criteria for determining genuine Māori tradition. Here with Ngaito, two of our own scholars, Sir Tipani O'Regan and Dr Te Māori Tau, developed this theme further and proposed a framework focused purely on the credibility of the teller or source of tradition as opposed to any attempt to validate the tale. Traditional tales are far too embellished with fanciful notions and supernatural adornments to allow the facts to be considered objectively but the credibility of a tradition can be agreed based on the credentials of the oral or written source. It was a simple matrix that said any tradition must be cross-referent with other sources of tradition, cross reference to early traditions between 1840 and 1900, supported by occurrence in Waiata, Whakatauki and place names, persistent through to present times, and cross reference to tribal whakapapa. And these sorts of things allow us to build up a, a solid understanding of whether or not a tradition is valid. Is it at all appropriate for the modern information managers to be taking a role in commenting on what is fantasy and what is legitimate knowledge? In an open source environment where so much is now available to so many, what is the role of digital archive managers, traditional archives and libraries in commenting on the accuracy and credibility of the information that they hold? Both Brailsford's and Simmons' books have made their way onto the shelves of our libraries. The early works and the more recent works that lack entirely in credibility are available, and the question must be asked, how, could, how would the casual reader know what is legitimate 
and what is a load of old cobblers. And it, it is at this point that libraries do have some culpability and some responsibility. Each one of these works potentially end up bestowed with credibility based simply on where they sit in the Dewey Decimal Cataloguing System. Do they sit alongside Michael King, Margaret Orbell and Judith Binney, or are they somewhere on the shelves with Carlo Castagnara, Eric Von Daniken, or C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien? <laughs> the post-settlement iwi renaissance movements are having a dramatic impact on emerging New Zealand identities. Within Ngaito itself, thousands of people self-identify as Ngaitahu with absolutely no other cultural influence beyond knowing a Māori grandparent existed and a genealogical right to affiliate. For many of them, there is an insatiable desire to become more Māori, to become more kaitahu, and they are pursuing formulaic ways to be so. Many are isolated from traditional marae or kāinga and with no established relationships, often turn to libraries and the internet to develop their identities. I regularly come across individuals adamant that they are not ngaitahu, but from the peaceful Waitaha tribe that did not have war or cannibalism. Often these same people are scathing of other aspects of Māori society and politics, yet their base identity markers and points of reference are all drawn from false tradition that has not been classified as opinion, but as history or tribal knowledge. It has been freely available and unchallenged by those passively holding and making the information available. Here in a more local setting, I have been an absolute champion of local tradition in southern Kaitahu dialect. That journey has been interesting. As in many respects, Kaitahu has been operating from a zero base in terms of speakers. So we've actually been reconstructing our language from memory and manuscripts. In that respect, local archival resources have been invaluable and the depth is rich potentially to the point that nearly the entire Ngaitahu dialectal form could be re reconstructed from archival material alone, so, so long as we have the speakers to perpetuate it. One document we discovered, if you like, in the Canterbury Museum Library significantly affected my thinking. It was a lengthy document, about 20,000 words, written in the late 19th century by two Kaitahu Komatua, Hwani Tapihate Waniko and Tami Green. For whatever reason, they decided to reject what was already an established orthographic convention here in the South and write the entire document in Southern dialect. This included the phonetic rendering of the, the nasal vela, ng, ng, as a K, almost entirely throughout the document, but also extensive use of vocabulary that was already out of popular use and was probably unheard again within a generation of these two gentlemen passing on. But what was most profound to me was the use of proverb and turn of phrase to tell the story. The story told was the entire migration of, of Kati Kuri, a sub-tribe of Kaito from the Wairarapa right down to Rakiura. And though I'd read early Pākehā records from people like Cannon Stack and A.H. Um, Carrington and Māori versions from old Mrs. Beaton and others, this was quite different. The other records explained events telling each chapter like a Robin Hood or William Tell story. Interesting, exciting characters and a good yarn, but remarkably depoliticised and in many respects without context, telling a tale. The Waniko and Green version was reminiscent of biblical type parables, each line with a standalone purpose in its own right, every verse punctuated with a proverb. At the end of the document, Te Waniko, the narrator, recites his own whakapapa and greens in descent lines from the key protagonists within the narrative. This document was not a story, but a title deed to the Kaikoura and South East Coast estates. In 20,000 words, he explained that these were his proverbs, this was his land, he was a man of mana, kāti. It was an insight for me about the importance of proverb and pepiha. Uh, that it was these expressions alongside turns of phrase that we now call kiwaha that really define tribal uniqueness and dialect, much more than phonetic differences. By this time, I was an observer of poetry from other iwi and I could see that in environments where there was a depth of tribal knowledge, this was the literary wisdom drawn upon to show expertise, to argue points and to create humour. <clears throat> 
It also defined a form of identity. The use of certain phrases was a form of recognition or identification. It was these narratives and their mode of telling that were pre-European literary storehouses. I went on a personal crusade to push kaitahu pepeha, whakatauki and kiwaha. I wanted a future where our own pai pai would be able to debate, joke and accentuate issues by drawing on this kaitahu library. It's our, it's our responsibility to influence the identity of our children, the next generation, from a dial and from a dialectal perspective, this is where I would choose to focus. Dialect is important because it paints a local environment with vocabulary that emerges from within one very local world. When I go fishing with our kids, I want to be able to use the full range of vocabulary that our ancestors used to identify the fish, the scales, the fins, to describe the act of fishing, the motion of the waves, gutting of the fish, etc., etc. Or when we're doing the garden, getting dressed in the morning, I want the experience that they take with them into the future to be memories of someone using the dialect. I want them to overhear me interacting with other kaitahu adults, having discussions in kaitahu dialect. In an ideal world, we would see local institutions well positioned to respond to such local issues, but that is not yet the situation here. In fact, it's a struggle to be a Māori speaking family, let alone a kaitahu speaking family in a community such as this. I'm not convinced that the local institutions have any idea how to respond to such a local need despite the fact that the absolute storehouse of primary source material regarding Ngaitau dialect is to be found right here in the Hokan archives. But with some real irony, the Hokan has chosen to name itself, no doubt with local tangata whenua consultation, the Uari Tauka or Hākena. Oh, that's going to... To anybody that's got any understanding of Māori language, this probably looks a bit odd. This particular decision serves to highlight one of the problems I've been discussing. Within the, the Ware Tauka or Hākena resides the most comprehensive resources of Kaito dialect. You'll find the original diaries of Edward Shortland, who walked from um, uh, travelled the southern coast from Dunedin to, uh, Raki, uh, to Rakiuda and then also walked from about Karetani up to Akaroa collecting notes but also put together the first uh, word list of South Island Māori. There's also uh, records from the Reverend Vollers who lived on Ruapuki Island, a small island off the coast of Stewart Island and published extensively the, the southern traditions using as much as possible the southern dialect. Here is Beatty's huge archive comments extensively on the southern dialects, as does Mantel in his notebook, which I think is also deposited in the Hokan. There's Harwood's journal and all of the Ngaito evidence of the Waitangi Tribunal, which contains extensive Kaitahu dialect information. But one of the most interesting records are the notebooks of James Watkins, who was Otago's first missionary, who arrived just north of here at a little place called Karetani in May 1840. He attempted to record a dialectal record of the local people once he realised there were differences between what he was hearing and the available Church Missionary Society Māori language material collected from Northland. Watkins had arrived in New Zealand via Tonga in Sydney and it's quite possible that he had been influenced by his linguistic experiences elsewhere in the Pacific. He claims that when he started to talk the Māori language that he had learnt no one understood him and he was, the, and he was faced with the challenge of constructing a resource of local dialect. His word list is legend, legendary amongst Ngaito and local historians and the, uh, the original was housed in the Hokan. Ray Harlow is the foremost expert on the document and he raises many questions about Watkins objectivity and accuracy as did Pybus in an earlier generation. The words are likely have to have been influenced by Watkins' knowledge of other Polynesian languages and it's apparent that he was very frustrated with his appointment to New Zealand and he wanted out. In fact, experts on Watkins suggest he was clinically depressed as he called his service in Otago purgatory. 
The naming of the Hocken Library in Māori no doubt included some form of local endorsement from Tangata Whenua, and a decision was taken to adopt the name Te Wari Tauka o Hākena. This is opposed to the standard Māori version of Te Whari Taonga o Hākena. The primary shift of the nasal velar NG to K is common in South Island dialect, but the shift from whare to, to uare is not common. In fact, there is only one example I'm aware of where uare is used to describe a house, and that is in some examples of Watkins' word list. Well, you couldn't even see what I wrote, did you? That's what it looks like. Uare. Sorry. 18, yeah. um, it's most likely that Watkins was actually attempting to record the difficult sound WH that is heard in English in words like whisper and whistle. Listening to speakers of many dialects, the initial sound in a word like whare is not ever really heard as a hard F, but it's also not heard as a silent letter either. In other parts of the country, you'll, it'll come out like an H and all sorts of different ways of pronouncing it. This was the crux of the debate around Whanganui or Wanganui. Listening to a Māori speaker from north of Auckland, it's easy to see that the WH is pronounced quite differently to the expected F as in Whangarei. Adopting the Uari spelling for, the ha for house accepts a very narrow path of orthographic convention. Amongst the amazing Hocken collection are records from all sorts of sources as outlined above. <clears throat> BT Mantel, Wallers, Chapman or Harwood do not mention house as in, as in Uari. In fact, the only source is Watkins. For whatever reason, Hocken have adopted this word in their title, and it would seem to be in spite of the evidence that could be accessed from within their own resource. In an environment where so much is available to so many, is there a responsibility within our community institutions to behave with more care? And that's the thought I guess I'd want to leave with the conference this morning. As a depository of such uh, import, and I know that there's been some discussion on intellectual property rights and um, uh, who has the, uh, the right to redistribute and who should have access to some of these resources, but equally, what's the care that institutions such as libraries and uh, information management organisations should have in terms of uh, interpreting or making available information that is potentially harmful to tribal tradition, Māori development, and the general storehouse of Māori knowledge. And I guess my suggestion is uh, perhaps more care than we have seen to this point in time, more responsibility and uh, less passivity in terms of uh, Māori knowledge. I know that that raises some issues, particularly for non-Māori, and that there's also a debate going on that says, actually, it's probably best for non-Māori to have as little opinion as possible about these things, because it's only a matter of time before you get your fingers burnt. Whereas um, my argument would be quite the contrary, that I think where there is capability, where there is competence, where there is good scholarship, that there's also a responsibility for good leadership. And that doesn't only mean within one cultural paradigm. I think that's across the board. And certainly uh, the position and the um, responsibility of such institutions uh, does mean that they do impact significantly in this period on the interpretation of Māori knowledge, whether we like it or not. Oh. Kia ora, tātou.